Hello again from Iceland. Here's another little story, another landscape for us to explore together. Um, part of my Iceland series on my travels here. So let's focus on this location here. Um, there's a big lake out here. I believe it's pronounced, although I'll probably butcher it, Klifarvatn. Um, and this is a groundwater filled lake. So this lake is actually has no streams or rivers that run into it. It's completely filled <clears throat> by groundwater percolating in from the surrounding hills. So it sits in a true basin. Apparently, uh, there were some earthquakes here in the year 2000, uh, one of which was magnitude six or six and a half, I believe. And since then, the lake has actually dropped uh, anywhere from 10 to 20% of its size because uh, perhaps that earthquake broke open some fractures. You know, Iceland has, you know, every hill, every, ridge you see in Iceland, every prominence uh, topographically is the result of typically some sort of volcanic process. And we want to focus on one today. There's the typical cinder cones and, and fissures. There's even uh, shield volcanoes. There's even a few stratovolcanoes and rhyolitic lava domes in Iceland. But most of the volcanism is basaltic. And here in Iceland, which has ice, now remember that this area was once heavily glaciated. There was a large ice cap that covered much of the country uh, during the last Pleistocene Ice Age. Today, there's five or six uh, large glaciers left that are dwindling rapidly. But a lot of the volcanic activity that took place here happened beneath the glacier. And so I want to start with um, a diagram that I found on the internet. And I'm sorry, I, I did not cite this. But when we have a eruption occurring under a glacier, this is sort of a possible sequence that we might get. So here we have the ice up here uh, and the volcano erupting beneath the ice. Now, if we have sufficient ice up here, there's enough pressure on the underlying lava that that keeps it in check, right? It's, it's not explosive. It's not even manifesting itself at the surface. But what it's doing is this lava is reaching the bottom of the glacier. It's obviously melting some of the ice. And so we may get fracturing at the surface <clears throat> and thinning of the ice. And most of what we would see here are pillow basalts or pillow lavas at the bottom. So the pressure of all the ice above uh, results in just pillow lavas erupting. Now, if we take it to the next stage, as that ice gets thinner, eventually it gets breached and we have water sitting above this eruptive vent right here. So we've got our stack of pillows, but now with the ice removed and you know some amount of water on top of it, maybe tens of feet, maybe a couple hundred feet, but if the, the overlying pressure is not that substantial. Now what we get is fragmenting of the lava and we're getting more explosive type behavior. So this diagram could show, you know, a few little things happening down here, but now we're actually breaking the material up uh, and creating some tephra, creating a pyroclastic material that might get thrown in the air, depending on how thick this water is here. And so that's where you would get these, these breaches and tufts these, this material here that occurs when the volcano has breached the ice, but still possibly has uh, some water above it. And then in the last stage of the story, in this you know sort of perfect cartoon, eventually the volcanic activity in the lava uh, makes its way above the, the, the lake, this glacial lake here, and it starts erupting your typical basalts, what we call subaerial basalts. Um, and so that forms a hard cap rock. So this, this yellow stuff here, this tuff or this breccia, this stuff is typically a little softer, more permeability. Um, but now we have this hard resistant basalt cap on top. So by the time we erode the glaciers away, we're left with a landform that looks like this. Now, if it's coming out of one centralized vent, uh, the landform name is typically, it's a tuya. And these can be, these are some of the big mountains you see in parts of Iceland, just these big mesas or buttes just standing out there by themselves. In fact, if they were in the southwestern US, we would call them mesas or buttes, but these are a different landform, not sedimentary, completely volcanic in its geometry or it's, uh, excuse me, and it's uh, pr the process in which it forms. And so these are known as tuyas. If the eruption though happened to have been along a fissure, so more of a long linear, so imagine this thing continuing in and out of the page, making a long uh, continuous ridge, uh, then they're typically called tindars uh, or mobergs. So kind of like two different names there for uh, these, these types of features. And that's actually what we have here uh, both behind me and across the way. So this impressive ridge that's maybe, I don't know, six, 700 feet tall 
has just a, a totally flat uh, surface or nearly flat surface on the top and if you look over here you can see that there's a thin maybe a few tens of feet thick uh, layer capping it I, obviously I didn't hike up there but I'd, I'd bet my bottom dollar that that's a layer of subaerial basalt the stuff below it forming the slope I do know what that is because I did look at it and it's the same thing I have over here behind me and so this is a good place to look at at least two of these layers one up close and one from a distance these are some of the pyroclastic materials the tufts the breaches I know I'm using a lot of words here but basically this is where the volcano was erupting beneath a very thin veneer of ice or maybe some amount of water and it was erupting uh, explosively so all the lava was being broken into pieces sometimes the pieces were big sometimes quite small and the main thing here is you can see that this this material is bedded it's layered uh, it has layers to it um, and the thickness of this can vary somewhat this particular one here I'll walk you out to a nice vantage point where we can look up the slope probably uh, several hundred feet thick um, in places there's some subtle variations in the particle sizes here but right here it looks like it's dominated by the finer material ash and very small fragments what we call lapilli uh, maybe pea size bb size that kind of thing and then occasionally we get these these bigger class these larger chunks in these bedded deposits um, there's actually an interesting relationship here you can see the layers over here are maybe not quite horizontal I think they're dipping slightly to your right but then if we look just across the way here we can see another layer of the same material but it's actually tilted towards you so it's dipping the other way um, almost opposed to this layer here so it's quite likely that there's a fault running through this this little saddle here along the ridge line but I wanted to walk you over to where we can look up this ridge to the west and see the contact between the the breccia the tough layer the pyroclastic material and then the capping lava flow uh, there's some really nice blocks here that have broken off really well exposed don't have all the moss growth on them and you can see there's kind of alternating layers here layers where the eruption has larger material and layers where it's more fine-grained and that could represent uh, more explosive phases where it's able to fragment the <clears throat> the material more completely uh, and then less energetic phases um, where it's not fragmenting the material as much so if we look up the slope here I'll try to point it out as best I can on the camera you can see some of the reddish bedded material and then just above it you see some of the the dark gray um, basalt up there and I believe without walking up there I feel pretty good about this that that is the contact between this material here the the tough the breccia the fragmented lava and then what we would call a subaerial lava meaning the the lava is just under the air subaqueous means it's underwater subglacial means it's under ice and subaerial means it's under air so your typical just lava erupting on the land type of thing so that's where that would essentially represent the the elevation of the lake the glacial lake that this volcano erupted into and you can see this ridge continuing so this ridge is running we lose it behind the outcrop here but this is running uh, north <coughs> east southwest similar to that one and similar to a lot of these uh, eruptive fissures we see here in southwest Iceland um, so hopefully that was pretty instructive again uh, a landform feature maybe you were unaware of that happens when glaciers or excuse me when volcanoes erupt beneath glaciers and if you ever get to Iceland and drive around you might look for some of these features and some of these landforms because uh, they're quite distinctive you can oftentimes see these these ridges that are pretty flat and obviously capped by a more resistant rock type and then these big slopes un underneath here I'm going to try to get to one more location here in the next day or two that'll show us the units below this so what does the pillow lavas at the bottom look like and how that grades into these breaches and tufts here so hopefully this was helpful uh, again send some uh, 
some donations my way if you can. If not, just keep enjoying them and have a great day here from Iceland.